Thanks for coming. These two speakers will talk about the Trusted Boot module, a project they developed as an open hardware module, a project that they are doing to create a trusted boot chain. Uh, the two speakers are two speakers are Guido from Nordende and Marai Weyer. And I will hand it over to them. Thank you very much. Seems to be fine. One, two, three. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. So, um, yeah, I'm going here to talk about our Trusted Boot module. Uh, subtitle Trusted Boot on the Olimex, Olimex in your line, but it actually works on more than just uh, this ARM development board. Um, I will first give you an introduction of how it works. We'll talk about the features, the limitations. Um, then I'll give you a brief uh, overview of the design and then we'll go into each of the uh, those parts of the design in more detail. Um, we'll give you uh, a status report of where we are um, and possibly present future work. Um, so I was briefly introduced, I'll take a few minutes to introduce myself a bit more. Um, I'm currently doing a Master's of Science uh, in Computational Science at, uni at the University of Amsterdam and uh, I did a, my Bachelor's there as well. I'm hoping to finish very soon. <laughs> I'm more of a software guy than hardware, but I'm trying to transition a bit more to hardware as well, just for fun. Um, I really like hackerspaces. The one in Sofia and the one in Amsterdam are both brilliant, and actually all the ones I've been to are, are excellent. Um, and at OM 2013, I started a foundation in the Netherlands called Hardcore Internet Freiheit, and we're trying to run more exit nodes and make Tor more well-known to the, to the general public. So if you're Dutch and you're interested, please contact us there. I work at Whitebox Systems, which is initiated by Guido, and he'll uh, introduce himself a bit more, and I sometimes work for the Internet Archive. Um, okay, so back to the Trusted Boot module. Uh, there's three main goals here. Um, in contrast to what you might know as UEFI or Secure Boot, we really want it to be owner-controlled. The thing is, is yours to hold, the thing is yours to hack, the thing is yours to do whatever you want with, so it's not designed to lock you out of your system. Um, our main personal goal was to prevent permanent compromise of our devices in the field. And our trusted boot module has one restriction that we'll get into that more a lot later. Um, it's specifically protecting the device going online and it assures that it's at that point only running trusted code, but it can't protect your device forever, as most, like most other <laughs> boot mechanisms. So I'll briefly hand it over to Hido to provide some context on how and why we made the system. Yep. Okay. Um, yes, I, I'll just do a brief introduction of, of myself and the context for the work. Uh, Marlene, together with two people, with Stefan, who's also sitting here, did main the main uh, technical part. Um, so the context of this project is this little white box, and the white box is uh, um, something we've been working on for three years, and this is a uh, authorization server that sits with general petitioners um, and allows general petitioners to authorize specific parties to access medical information. So in contrast to many large-scale information exchange systems in healthcare, um, this one is actually controllable by the doctor and possibly the patient if he has an account on it as well. So we're trying to build mechanisms to um, um, allow doctors to authorize other doctors to access content, but you know, to, to keep the access servers and the attack servers very small. Um, this little box sits with general petitioners and we um, uh, pretend that we have a secure solution and that also suggests that people can trust it. But what does that mean? Because this box is now white, but it's essentially a black box. So what we're trying to do is actually make it a really white box and to have everything that's in there open and controllable. We have software running on it that's published source. Uh, we don't give away the copyright, but we do open it up so people can access it and, in and inspect it. Um, and uh, we have a reproducible build chain that we've been working on that has not been published yet, but we've been working on it. Debian has a similar uh, approach and we're applying it to Gentoo. Um, where the source code can be 
are built in a reproducible way such that many people can actually build from the source the same binaries and check that that is actually the binary that runs on this box. Um, still, that does not really make it a trustworthy distributed systems. There are many things to consider them. And one of the things is, do we actually know the software that runs on there? So we need the software to be signed. Um, and preferably, we need a, a number of people or parties to sign the software that's been re reproducibly built. And we need a verification system for that. So the system currently runs on the Olimax boards. Um, it's also been running on a QB board and it could conceivably also run on a Raspberry Pi, which is just an ARM-based development board with Linux running on it and our own application stack that, that we're going to publish. Um, and um, um, the trick is how, how can we verify the software that runs on it and ensure that uh, if there has been a compromise that it can be uh, restored and removed from uh, the thing because you know it's a distributed system so we cannot actually walk to the GP and say you know pull the plug and re reconfigure the whole thing so that is the context why we need a trusted boot manager we need some mechanism where we can have uh, the system fetch updates we can control them control the sign uh, verify the signatures and control the boot process do regular updates of the system so we reboot every day so it, you know um, as a you know, general measure. Um, and each time that we boot the system, verify that we have the latest updates and the latest version, and that's actually been signed by us or maybe other parties. But of course, the principle of that is general. And so Stichting and Alnet uh, has provided us with some funding to actually provide this as an open source, not published, really open source, um, an open hardware project. So we've been designing the hardware um, and the software that runs on the MCU on the hardware um, to do this this actual image verification um, and and this protocol to um, ensure that the uh, the boot process is trustworthy and uh, well I'm going to give back control to uh, to Malayan who is going to uh, talk about the technical details more. Thank you very much. Okay, let's see. Yeah, this is good. All right. Okay, so. Um yeah, so a, a part of this is that the system will reboot is every few days or every day, sort of, in case there is a compromise, uh, it will at least go back to what is uh, trusted code and then from there on hopefully load code that's not exploitable again. Um, and specifically, it should be very infeasible to permanently compromise such a device remotely. Um, it should be uh, clear at this point, I think, that uh, local attacks are not uh our, our aim here, because you, you, you own the thing, so if you take it apart and flash it, well, of course you <laughs> owned it. Um, uh, so Guido briefly talked about the device that we're currently using. It's an Olimax Olinux Xenoline 2, and this is our host device. This is not what the trusted boot module runs, runs on. I'll, I'll get to that soon. Um, but it's a dual core machine. It has one gigabyte of RAM, uh, SATA, gigabyte Ethernet, USB, and a lot more storage options, uh, including SPI North Flash. And it's um, one of the reasons we're also using it is because it's open hardware. Um, so you can download the schematics, you can verify it, you can make the PCB yourself if you want. Um, of course, open hardware here means that the designs are open source, but there's no uh, CPU on there that's open source. There's no RISC V uh, development board that we are uh, able to use yet. Okay, so the trusted boot uh, manager uh, module essentially um always ensures that the system boots to a trusted state. So that means that whatever the CPU starts running, uh, it should be our code right away. Uh, usually there's just a tiny bit of code that actually starts with the CPU and then loads code from somewhere. Um, but it should load our code as soon as possible and whatever code is the s whatever code the CPU is running before it loads our code, it should be read only and, and uh, uh, people shouldn't be able to change it remotely. Um, so of course we need to be able to upgrade the operating system so um, um, we need to upgrade our kernel. So if our kernel is in a read-only segment, then how do you ensure that you get a re more recent kernel with that doesn't have exploits, those kind of things. Um, and, and we're hoping to make it relatively cheap um, for people to produce themselves, take the, take the PCB and, and, and assemble it. Um, 
and we are trying also to handle various um, levels of complexity in the process of boot module. You can envision uh, different use cases for the process of boot module, and I'll get into those in more detail a bit later. Um, a bit of terminology. I'll explain all of these things again, but just, just to repeat them. Uh, the trusted boot module is obvious. Uh, something we call the ROTS is the read-only trusted system. This is the code that we load initially. Um, and it's an image stored read-only in, in some storage. Um, obviously, when I say flash, I'm going to be referring to SPI nor flash here, so it's not about NAND flash. Uh, There's a big difference in reliability and how much you can store on there. SPI nor flash is supposed to be very reliable. It should last 10 to 20 years, even if you're writing quite a bit to it, and NAND is... There's uh, a special art for balancing NAND failures and <laughs> growing <laughs> growing the uh, size of the NAND without uh, causing uh, real failures. Um, this is essentially what SSDs are doing there, just putting in more more NAND. Um, we have the trusted stage and the untrusted stage of the of the the boot process. It's that should be fairly evident. Um, when I say U-boot, that's uh, referring to the universal bootloader, which is the bootloader you find on lots of uh, MIPS and ARM systems. So most of the ARM development boards run U-boot. Most of your Android phones run U-boot in one way or the other. Most of the OpenWRT or even most of the uh, home routers run U-boot in one way. Um, the initial RAM OFS is the initial RAM file system. It's something that Linux loads as soon as it starts, uh, so you don't you just have something in RAM that looks like a file system and then it's you can put binaries in there. Um, so you don't need, uh, say, a USB stick for <laughs> you to be able to load any root file system. Um, KXEG is a method we use that is in the Linux kernel as of, I think, one, two, maybe three years that you can use to load a new kernel from Linux without restarting, going through your BIOS again and the whole process. So you can actually load a new Linux kernel from Linux. Okay, so... A simplified explanation of the Lime 2 is, of, of the trusted boot process on the Lime 2 would be that our code uh, always needs to be uh, executed first. And in this trusted stage, um, which we are in when we load the code, we can communicate with the trusted boot module. Um, this is a separate hardware device that's connected to the Lime. And the Lime itself will cryptographically check the validity of the images. So this is very different from a TPM where um, the TPM has a lot of crypto in there and random number generators. And the, the TBM is uh, purposely very simple, so any crypto operations will simply be done on your host system. Um, and of course, the, the, the whole system will uh, boot new kernels and, and, and tell the TBM that there's no longer um, a reason to trust the code that we're running because it might now be code that we fetch online as an update and uh, we no longer want to be able to <laughs> communicate with, uh, we, no, we no longer want to have privileged access to our trusted boot module for, for storage reasons or such. Um, so the setup is very simple. There's a Lime 2 board. Uh, I think uh, Kido has it there right now, and there's this thing. Uh, this the is Lime 2? Yes. So this is the ARM base, and, th and this is a prototype of TBM. So right. Yeah. So the Stick them together. <laughs> right. So they, they fit on each other. So the TCB was made to fit on the Lime too. So how it works is the TBM is a very simple um, ARM microcontroller. Um, it has uh, so some form of RTC, um, some form of battery for the RTC. Um, and it actually has storage as well. It also has an SPI NOR flash chip, so it can store certificates or keys or log files or specific operating system versions to prevent rollbacks. Um, Right, and the TBM and the Lime, they communicate using serial, so you simply <laughs> take UART from both sides, connect them, and they, they can talk with each other. And this, of course, will work for uh, routers as well, or Raspberry Pis, or non-ARM platforms. Um, and the TBM <laughs> has some other features that I'll get into later. But yeah, it, it should work on, on most architectures out there, and. We're hopefully we're hopefully going to take maybe a Liberboot machine next time, which is I'm not sure if you know Liberboot, but it's a uh, it's a fork of Coreboot, which is an open source BIOS that runs on on certain machines, and it should not use any blobs at all on your system. And uh, Liberboot is a the blob version of Coreboot, so that might make a nice target, or maybe an open WRT router for people who really don't want their routers to be compromised permanently. Um, 
Yeah, so our goal is to prevent r remote compromise, especially permanent remote compromise, but that's very difficult. So we're trying to reasonably prevent uh, <laughs> permanent remote compromise because there are some exploits that could, um, th like there could be some bugs in our, our read-only firmware, uh, for example, loading a file system, loading an X4 file system. If there's a certain corruption in the X4 file system, then uh, the, the read-only the, the read-only code could be exploited and then before it even starts to load other code you can already break in. Um, that's why it says reasonably. Um, another huge feature for the TBM for us of course is that we can put certificates in there or keys in there that are used to verify uh, updates or, or, or images that are being downloaded so that you can have uh, all the usual X X509 certificates, um, you can use a CA, um, and you can have multiple keys and multiple certificates in there. And our, our, our goal is to have a threshold system where we would have three or five parties that all sign the code, put their signature on there, and those certificates of those parties will be in the trusted boot module. And then when an upgrade is downloaded, it needs, it wouldn't be, uh, it has to be signed by at least, say, three out of five parties. So even if one or two parties become compromised or they no longer exist, at least we can uh, still distribute the software. Um, as I said before, the TBM is not a TPM, so um, we it doesn't do crypto, it doesn't do keygen. We were not planning at all to implement our own crypto on, on a simple microcontroller unit, um, and it doesn't have a, a proper source of randomness, so we're that was completely out of our scope, and, and spe 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 specifically the crypto part. If we have Linux on a device, we can just write code in C or in Go that ha already has the crypto libraries, and we can just reuse them instead of writing it ourselves. Um, so our focus has really been on making the project not too large, <laughs> making it feasible and, and hopefully uh, easily usable for, for other platforms as well. Um, yeah. I think I covered most of this at this point. Well, we'll, we'll get some more of this, but uh, I, I've, I've talked about the line. Uh, the, the microcontroller we're using is a Cortex-M3. Um, I'll talk a bit about how the write protect works in the flash, so it's actually read-only code, not writable code. Um, I'll go into more detail about the boot process, so how do we actually ensure that nothing interferes with the boot process and it, it actually only loads our code. Um, and then there's the image verification and image loading. So this is what our first hack looked like, and I hope you can see it from the distance. So this is a zoom in of a line board. Um, it's approximately a zoom in of, of this part of the line board. So this is, these soldering joints here are actually pretty small. and. A uh, very friendly hacker from the Amsterdam hackerspace helped me solder these three wires <laughs> because these three wires were needed to actually get the device to boot from SPI newer flash. Um, I um, gave a, uh, a small version of this talk half a year ago um, with the people who made these devices and they listened. And now we have a very nice device which has an SPI newer flash on there so no longer we, need to we don't longer need any hardware modifications at all. So that's nice. <laughs> um, okay, so the, the the line has a lot of a lot of serial lines. I think it has six or seven, as most all Winter 20 devices do. Uh, UR0 will be for debugging, and we are using UR2 to communicate with the TBM. Um, one specific thing I haven't mentioned yet, or I, I glance over it, is that we can't have any other storage on the line that is NAND, eMMC, or microSD cards. We can have SATA. The reason for this is that there is um, some small uh, portion of code fused in all the all winner A20s that decides what where to load from, right? So if you plug in an SD card, you're hoping it will load from your SD card before it loads something from NAND because you would have to desolder NAND to get it to <laughs> not boot from NAND. Um, so there's an order in here, and I think it might be somewhere in the presentation elsewhere, so I'm not going to mention it now. But the point is that it's very hard to protect these types of storage from uh, remote parties, uh, to prevent remote parties from writing anything to them. They don't have very nice write protection mechanisms. You can mount something as read-only in Linux, but that's not very strong. You can just remount it as read-write, or if you break into the kernel on, on a different level, you can just write to it. Um, micro SD cards specifically are <laughs> interestingly complex, and they have their own operating system, and I think Bunny showed several years ago that you can, in fact, break into those <laughs> operating systems and, and do a lot of weird things. There's a link to that uh, blog post at the end of the presentation. S and the same goes for EMMC and, and NAND. 
So all our data is instead stored either on, on USB plugs, which is not a very reliable solution, so we use SATA and have a hard disk for an SSD attached. Um, and as I said before, the Lime 2 now has support for SPI NoFlash. I will get to how the write protect on the SPI NoFlash works in a bit. Um, so I explained a part of this when I when I refer to the, the small code that is on the line that loads the, uh, the, the, the next code from either the micro SD card or, or flash. That's called the BROM or the boot ROM. And in our case, the boot ROM finds an SPI NOR flash chip. And then from that SPI NOR flash chip, it loads something called the SPL, which is a simple program loader. The reason that we have a simple program loader because it's because the boot ROM is very limited in how much how large a program can be that it loads. So it loads a program, and that program can handle larger pieces of code, and then <laughs> that program loads U-boot from the SPI flash. So it's just another step to actually get the bootloader loaded. And then from, from U-boot, which is our bootloader, you can compare it, I guess, to, to Grub as well. Um, U-boot will then load the Linux kernel from the SPI NOR flash. This was uh, one of the tricky parts of the project because there was no support for this at all. There, there's some devices that have uh, support in U-boot to load from SPI NOR flash, but the A20 didn't have it. Um, so Stefan, one of my colleagues, he implemented the U-boot SPI driver for A20 devices, for A64 devices, A32, which is a large range of owner devices. Um, and the patches are, I think, still somewhere stuck in the mailing list, but they work really well. <laughs> so somewhere next year, they'll probably be merged into, into U-boot. Um, okay, so um, you will, will then load Linux, and the Linux kernel will start up, and it will load the initial RAM file system, which again is a small file system containing, say, uh, a shell and some other basic program, so you can run the script and, and boot your real operating system. So then the Linux, the Linux kernel plus the initial MFS will communicate with the TBM. It will say, "Hi, I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, uh, the host operating system, and I would like you to give me, tell me what keys I can trust, what certificates are are." are are part of that those keys? Uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, go with the go along with those keys. I would like you to tell me what the software version was that I last loaded because uh, I have no place to save it. Um, and then uh, we will load a verified kernel and images using kexe. So again, there's there's a lot of things going on here to verify images to figure out what what is the what is the latest image of our operating system? Can we trust it? Is it signed by enough parties? and then it will be loaded combined with a new kernel. So this again is why I'm, I'm, s I'm mentioning kexec here. Um, we could have opted for not loading a new kernel, but then eventually your kernel gets really out of date and if you change devices only every five or six years, that becomes a real nuisance because your kernel is connected to the network and you don't want to do that. And of course, by the way, the reason that we, uh, as from the host slash Lime side, can't save any files on our um, we can't save any state is because the only other place we can write to is our SATA disk and if we get compromised then somebody can just write to that SATA disk and, and put there whatever it wants. So that's, is that's another reason we have the TBM so we can have some, some, some form of safe storage. So I think this is kind of what I told you before um, just now but in the graph. So uh, there's the boot ROM that loads the simple program loader. The simple program loader loads U-boot and U-boot loads the kernel and from there on we can load another kernel um, and then, then we're all good to go. So all of this code is on a read-only flash chip. So none of this can be changed unless you have physical access. The same goes for the TBM, but it's kind of isolated completely, so there's no real risk there. Okay, so what are we actually using in the, in the TBM? <laughs> I'm not going to pronounce the full name of this STM chip, but uh, it's an STM32F1. Uh, uh, um, it's an ARM Cortex M3, and the features it has are, are, are serial to communicate with the Lime and uh, SPI. Uh, it says possibly, but it definitely has SPI because we use it to interface with another flash chip that's on the uh, on the boot manager. And we're specifically using something called LibOpenCM3, and we actually picked the STM32 chips because of this reason, because this is a very nice project that has a, a, a free library for many of these STM32 uh, um microcontrollers and it's actually s expanding to other ones as well. It's LGPL licensed and it was it was really great with good documentation that made it very easy to just use GCC and whatever normal normal tools you're used to to do um, embedded work. Um, at least we, we liked it. 
Um, the program is done using uh, JTAG debuggers with OpenOCD, which is the op open on chip debugger. So what you can essentially do is you can just uh, connect your, your SDM32F1 uh, and then you can just hook GDB to that uh, chip and, and, run and load your code and debug it. Um, of course, we need the tool chain to, to build the whole thing. Um, we have documentation at the end of the presentation that basically explains our, our whole process and has links to these tool chains. Um, and as I said, the TBM also uses SPI and Flash for data storage. So there's another small chip on there um, to store data. We did most of our tests with the STM32F0 discovery board because when you start out with these things, you don't want to start out by designing your own PCB and then figuring out how these <laughs> microcontrollers work. Um, so for many months, we just used discovery boards and, and, and they were great. You can get them from uh, STM from ST. One of the more challenging things that we have in the TPM, I mean, some serial communication is, is relatively trivial, but one of the more challenging parts was the file system and the flash translation layer. So because we want to store parts uh, of, of, because we want to store certificates and keys and some log files and, and versions on, on, on the TPM, we needed a place to store it. And these microcontrollers have very, very little storage on, on board. So instead we simply decided to put another SPI NOR flash chip there because they're, again, very reliable and, and, and pretty cheap. Um, th you, can, you can get them in sizes from of one megabyte to 16 megabyte and 16 and that's pretty much the max, but they're, they're relatively cheap. So uh, Stefan, again, who worked on this project, um, he wrote a file system for this, um, uh, for SPI NOR flash, including a flash translation layer. We tried to find file systems that would just run uh, th there's some there's some nice flash file systems by um, in the Linux kernel as well, but those don't run on a microcontroller unit, and you can't just port such a huge file system to uh, to a microcontroller. They're very very resource, cons resource constrained. Um, so S Stefan started out by writing the file system, uh, and it became very complex because he uh, <laughs> really needed the flash translation layer to, to make those mappings a lot easier. And uh, at this point, it's working quite well. Um, we're still working on, on, on debu debugging some parts, but it's mostly been pretty stable. And uh, this is also included in, in the source release. And of course, uh, if you have a need for this, you can just take out just a, a file system and, and, and use it somewhere else. Um, this is a picture of our first set of PCBs. There's five of them. And I'm very happy that you probably can't see some of the bad soldering work we did. <laughs> I mentioned before, I'm mostly a software person, not a hardware person. so. We failed soldering at least four microcontrollers, and at some point we asked for some help, and eventually we managed to get it to work properly. Um, this is the, the version one, and version two will be smaller, and it will also be easier to hook up other boards. So this is what it looks like in, in action, so to say. So you can simply plug this PCB on top of the line, and the battery goes right there at the top, uh, but it's, it's not there right now. The battery is required to keep um, time, because the line again has no concept of time. It can't save the time anywhere. It has no no place to save the time where it can be modified by someone else. Um, the TBM can keep the time. It's not always required to keep the time, but if you're dealing with certificates, um, then it's usually useful to know if the certificate expired or not. Um, it depends on your use case. You can also not care about that, but it's uh, an optional feature of the TBM. Okay, so again, uh, Linux and Intramapas are on this SPI NOR flash chip, and they have full access to the TBM in what we call the trusted stage. There's two stage stages, a uh, trusted stage and untrusted stage. It's very simple. In the trusted stage, it can essentially do whatever it wants. Uh, there's probably some limitations, like you can't wipe logs or something, but um, it can ask for the time, it can read files, it can write files, um, and essentially do pretty much everything. So then the line two will get whatever information it needs, verify the image, and then load it. And then just before it does kexec and loads the possibly untrusted code, which is no longer physically on the device, so to say, it will tell the TBM, I am now moving to something, uh, to the untrusted stage, which is you can no longer trust me uh, for most of these commands because it might be some remote attacker who compromised the system and then wants to mess with this trusted boot module. The trusted boot module is always connected, so, uh, yeah, th there's always a serial line that works, so it, it, it's pretty hard to prevent people from talking with it, uh, but at least they can't mess with it. Um, 
and of course uh, in, in the whole trusted stage our kernel is very minimal it doesn't have any network capabilities so there's no no uh, attack vector there um, okay so th uh, the untrusted stage is, is, is as I said it's pretty simple um, in this stage the device can do whatever it's supposed to be doing but nothing more so at this point we're connected to the network um, we might be doing a lot of crypto or uh, th there's a chance of people breaking in and then the line has almost no access to the TBM. It can probably still maybe get the time and it can tell the TBM that it managed to boot successfully, which is one of the main <laughs> uh, things that the TBM really needs to know because otherwise it will just reset the line. Um, but yeah, it can't mess with the SPI flash chip. And again, of course, uh, in the untrusted stage, the, the operating system can load other code it can fetch new updates, it can restart programs, it can download zips, do whatever it wants, but this is not something we can protect against. It's not, it's not our, our goal of the TBM to, to protect against this. What we want to protect against is somebody trying to mess with the next reboot when we forcefully uh, reboot the system again. So th the most essential part here is that the line can simply tell the trusted boot manager that it has <laughs> been able to successfully boot. Okay, so I haven't talked a lot about this, but I mentioned some basic things. So there's one of the features of the, of the TBM is trust management, and uh, it can store several keys or certificates, and in a future version, it will also be able to contain uh, revocation statements of keys if the use case so desires. So we'll we're hopefully going to make the code uh, relatively simple, but if you want more features, you can enable them. Um, yeah, so this is basically the, the, the threshold scheme that I, I talked about before. We will require, say, three or four out of five keys to be, uh, four out of five signatures to be to be there um, to, to actually trust if, if an image is, is valid. We could store more, but uh, yeah. And again, um, I'm, I'm specifically saying keys here because um, there, there might be some scenarios where you don't want to deal with time and then the expiry of a certificate is, is kind of senseless so you can also just deal with keys and not deal with certificates at all. Um, but it, you can also use certificates so, so you can have a CA and, and deal with this. Um, yeah, key revocation could be required. Uh, in our case, we are not going to start with that um, because it's pretty complex. <laughs> um, and sometimes even human, human interactions, you want a personal or a person to go there and actually change the key. So it really depends on, on if you're a com if you're a sysadmin of the company who simply wants to secure his Wi-Fi routers and can just walk over there himself to him or herself to, to, to change any keys. So then you don't need any dynamic key management. You'll just load them in there with a programmer, for example. Um, there's no perfect trust management system and it really depends on, on your use case and, and whatever complexity you need. So your requirements essentially. In the most simple case, um, one or more keys can be stored in the read-only trusted system. So then they would not even need to be stored in the TBM. Uh, but this is a, a very uh, simple scenario. And these keys are used to verify the images. And again, you can just require a certain amount of, of keys there. Uh, but in this such a scenario, key revocation is impossible and you can't essentially manage any kind of keys. So this is more suitable for someone at home who just wants to secure uh, their machine. Yeah, just the first goal, and this this is working at this point. Um, so this can run on other devices. It doesn't just have to run on the Lime. It can run on the Raspberry Pi three or or other boards from Olimax or the the Pine sixty four or an Orange Pi or any of the other cheap Chinese development boards, as long as they can boot from SPI nor Flash, and they don't actually load any other code before that. So you need to have a way to ensure that it only boots from, from SPI nor Flash. So if someone plugs in a Z-card, that's kind of an issue. Um, and especially if there's onboard NAND Flash, then you b usually can't force it to boot to SPI nor Flash. The Raspberry Pi is a nice solution to this where you can simply um, connect certain pins together that will force it to boot from a certain uh, storage device. But most of the others don't have that. Okay, so the current status. Uh, serial works on the trusted boot module, the real-time plot works, and the file system is, is working. So on the uh, 
using the serial, you communica can communicate with the with the file system. You can say ls or or cut or write, and you can you can interact with the files. Uh, the protocol implementations between the trusted boot module and the line work, so they are able to talk to each other <laughs> um, and and communicate. And kxx seem to work, and we haven't actually run into a lot of issues yet. Um, I'm saying this because it's one of the things I was really afraid of is that if I'm if I'm having a Linux kernel from say version 3.0 and I want to boot 4.4.6, then it might be that they initialize devices very differently, and if the old Linux shuts down, it doesn't actually shut down certain devices, and then when the new Linux boots, it doesn't it can't initialize the device, and then you have a big problem. Um, but fortunately, this hasn't popped up yet. What we also tried to do is to actually boot from KXX to U-boot, um, but that didn't work very well. U-boot tried to initialize the memory again and, and completely failed, so we gave up on that. Um, the HPI uh, flash write protect works, but it requires uh, a fork of flash ROM. And flash ROM is a, a tool to program, well, uh, mostly, mostly uh, f uh, flash, flash devices. And Google forked it to add write protect support. So the way write protect works in these flash chips is that um, they usually have uh, eight pins or sixteen, depending on on the size of this chip. And if you pull the write protect pin down, you will uh, lock the write protect down. But that actually doesn't mean that you can't write to the flash chip. It just means that um, you can no longer change what regions are write protected and what ones are not. So <laughs> this is actually something that took me uh, a day or two to, to find out. Um, so what you're supposed to do is set up a, a, a region that's, that's supposed to be write protected, and then you'll say, OK, this region can no longer be changed, and then you enable the write protect. So if you just enable the write protect, you can still write to the flash chip. Um, yeah, as I said, we developed uh, a s an SPI driver for U-boot for the owner boards, and those patches are on the mailing list. Um, and uh, the Lime 2 hardware changes are, 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 are finished. So within the next few weeks, Olimax will release those new boards, and hopefully <laughs> everyone can play with it. And there are other A64 boards, which is a different system on chip, will also um, support SPI Neo Flash. And finally, one other feature that I haven't touched on a lot yet, but we seem to have some extra time, so I'll, I'll touch on that, um, is that the trusted boot module can reset the Lime. So in our case, uh, uh, Fido said it would be very nice if we can reset such a device daily, because if it's been running for a month, we can't really know if it's been compromised or not. So we need to find the balance between how long we let it run and how, long, uh, how annoying it is to reboot the device. So it could be a day, it could be a week, uh, something like this. So the TBM is connected to the Lime 2 um, through a specific pin <laughs> that will cause the Lime to reset. So if the TBM pulls it up, then the Lime resets. Um, so this is what we use for, for say, daily or weekly reboots. Um, and we came up with a mechanism to not just reboot daily, but also have the line tell the TBM, I just want to run for a little longer, so <laughs> hold off for a while. And we've even been thinking about uh, a network protocol where we can issue do not reboot signals to those devices so they could fetch something from our website and that's a, a, a signed statement with a timestamp in there that says you don't need to reboot that. But in the case of a serious problem where a lot of devices are compromised, we can simply not issue a do not reboot um, a signal. And then when the, t when the line is unable to send such a thing to the TBM, um, we have to reset, then the, line, the TBM will reset the line. The issue here, however, is that this will require some crypto on the TBM, and that's something we actually didn't want to do. So that's, that's not finished but it is able to reset the line. Um, so there's a lot of testing to be done still. I mean, everything seems to work, um, but it might not. So we're, we're planning on, on to test this a lot in the next, com the in the, in well the next few weeks. Um, and there's some work to be done in the read-only trusted system implementation still. It can verify basic images, but because we're also dealing with reproducible builds, we need to figure out what extra metadata we want of those reproducible builds. And, um, deal with multiple parties signing the, the, the software. We've actually spent some time writing user guides and tools for this talk and the hope that some people will read it and ask questions afterwards, um, but they're not fully finished. So there's quite some information there, but if something is not clear, then please, if you're reading it, if you're reading it uh, let us know. And 
and in the nearby future we will also provide documentation on how to use the TDM with other devices. And uh, complex trust management is still on the table because we haven't needed it yet and that really kind of depends on the read-only trust system there. Um, there are some attack vectors here that I haven't touched on yet, but they're all kind of subtle. <laughs> For example, if the TBM is power cycled at any point, it will forget or not know what state it is in, so it will always go to a trusted state. So if somehow a remote attacker can power cycle the TBM, then it can essentially just permanently compromise the system because then it can read files, it can write its own keys or certificates. Uh, so this is a real issue and Right now the TBM is connected to the lime, uh, but in a way that if the lime would try to pull the power, the lime itself would also reset. <laughs> um, but this is something that, that's very subtle and, and if you're just using this on your own device, um, you should be wary of this. We should probably mention that more clearly in the documentation. <laughs> um, and something I mentioned at the start of the talk, there's some permanent boot time exploits that you can imagine again. If we're using a file system, say X4, and that's on the SATA disk. And an attacker figures out how to write his or own file system there that when Linux le reads it, it actually overflows and then there's another <laughs> payload there that then executes while trying to mount the file system or check the file system. We have a real a problem because then the read-only trusted system is, is, is uh, compromised. Um, another thing that we <laughs> haven't figured out and it's actually kind of funny is you can't reboot as a, as a line right now. If you reboot then you don't know what to boot and the TBM won't talk to you because you're still in the untrusted state. So this is again where the, um, the lime, uh, where the TBM being able to reboot the lime comes in. That was in the, in the previous slide here. So the fact that the TBM can reset the lime is something we can use for rebooting. So then the lime can say, well, uh, can you reboot me and then move back to the trusted state? But we haven't done this in part because it we need to make sure that it <laughs> works the way it's supposed to work. Um, and of course, bugs in our trust management, simple simple things like key verification or, or image verification against the key shouldn't be such a big deal, but you need to be careful there. And that's in part why we're trying to keep it very simple at first, at least. Um, and this is <laughs> uh, something I think from the previous uh, uh, presentation because the TBM does have a concept of time now, or at least it can have a concept of time. So in this case, um, the TBM can give a, a valid time to the lime, and because the lime relies on the TBM in the first place, um, it ha can assume that the, the time that the TBM is giving it is sensible. Um, so there can be some concept of day and time, but if you don't need it and you're just using keys, not certificates, then you might not even need it. Um, and there are some obvious issues with the system, but those are, I think, uh, like we can't do anything about it. If an attacker logs into the system and we store all our updates on the SATA disk, then simply removing all the operating system files from the SATA disk will break the device. It can still load the real only trusted system, but there's nothing else you can start to, so um, the system no longer works. But I think this is preferable to a system that's permanently compromised and can steal your data whenever it wants. Um, yeah, so I, I touched on the reboot part here. I'm really hoping to move to some other devices as well with this project. So I've mentioned routers and laptops several times. One of my personal uh, favorites would be to have a reproduci reproducibly built system that runs uh, with people on the in the homes of people that runs Tor nodes. Um, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with Tor, but I'll give you a very very brief introduction. So Tor is a uh, uh, and an onion routing network, so it will, if you're using Tor to connect to the net, you can conceivably hide your location and identity to people if you're, if, you, if you're using it in a clever way. But it's a decentralized system, so it relies on other people running Tor nodes. And right now, it's, there's quite some people doing it, but it could be a lot more people running Tor nodes, and you need to keep them up to date to make sure that the network can be compromised, that the Tor network can be compromised. So this is, this is pretty difficult, so I really hope to take some parts of the work that we're doing here and turn it into reproducibly built Tor, Tor routers that can securely update themselves and people can just plug in at home and not worry about it ever and share like 20% of the network with the Tor network. Um, yeah, another open question would, would be that right now our boot image format is very simple so it contains the image, a few signatures and some metadata. Um, 
and we will need to expand that for a reproducible build setup. So there's a full chain of trust that you can trace all the way back to the first image you've ever booted. Um, as for the license, it will be something open. We haven't quite figured out what's fitting. Um, we, we are using libopencm3, so some parts will probably need to be at least LGPL. Some other parts might be uh, BSD licensed. There's a few other things I should really mention. Um, I've mentioned reproducible builds a couple of times. It was initiated by Debian, but opens, uh, SUSE is now doing it as well, and another distribution that I don't remember right now, but this is a really cool website if you want to figure out how reproducible builds work and who's working on it. And I think Debian has been a is able to reproducibly build like at least 94% of their packages. So it's really impressive, so probably everything you're using daily can be reproducibly built. And another really, really cool project is uh, HADS from, <laughs> from Dremel. And um, it's essentially, it can um, work with Tails. So it's, it's kind of like just as a boot manager, but it works with core boot. And it does a lot of cool things to actually prevent physical compromise to your device as well. So we are, in our project, mostly not caring about physical compromise. But if you're interested in this kind of stuff and really preventing, hopefully, government agencies to mess with your device at all, then you should really check out this project. And there was a very cool talk about it at uh, CCC as well. Um, we owe some thanks to, to various organizations and people and LNET for, for funding our project and, and letting us work on this project. Um, I personally owe some thanks to people at my local hackerspace for <laughs> explaining to me how, how some hardware parts work, helping me soldering things that I really can't solder. Uh, Olimax has been very kind in talking with us and figuring out how to fit our, our feature request, which is an SPI Neural Flash that doesn't require hot gluing and, and nasty soldering on their dev already very crowded devices. Um, OpenFest for allowing me to give a, a short version of this talk, and of course, Shah for organizing this awesome camp and uh, letting, letting us give this talk here. Um, yes, yeah, so that went pretty fast. Um, you can mail me at this address, and you can mail Whitebox Systems at uh, <laughs> basically our website. You can, you can find contact information there. Some more thanks go out to the really awesome Linux on XI community. Um, all winner themselves are not very well known for. Uh, basically handing out GPL license code and, 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 and helping the community develop proper Linux drivers for it. Uh, but the Linux Sun Sonic side community is basically people from all over the world that have picked up op all winners lame source jobs and they've fixed it and turned most of the code into proper drivers that are now in Linux. So without this community, we wouldn't have been able to do this at all on those all winner devices. And as a result of their work, in my opinion, those devices are one of the best supported ARM devices ARM development devices that you can get for, for, for cheap prices. Um, finally, um, some extra resources. So we've put up a simple page on open source that whitebox systems that are now that can contains links to the technical documentation and user documentation and has links to the, the Git repos for, for the source that's already online right now. The read only trusted state will come online in a few more weeks. Um, I think that's it. Thank you very much. So we have a ti some time left for questions. Uh, there are two microphones in the room. So please, in any questions, go to the microphone. Oh, wait, could you wait? Open up. <laughs> You're another developer of uh, Secure Boot software, thanks for the, the uh, plug for heads. Um, what's your motivation for not using a TPM? What one of the key features that uh, the TPM potentially provides is remote attestation, that if this server is talking to other servers to be able to uh, prove to some degree that the software running on the machine is what it says it is. Um, is that in scope, or is that something that is uh, sort of outside your, uh, your threat model? Are you talking about software that's been running at the system for a long time, or just during system startup? I, as you point out, it's hard to know. You know m most of these things really only assess the, secu the, uh, the system at boot time. Um, but when the, when the machine goes to, say, communicate with an outside server, 
Is it uh, desirable to be able to get a uh, something like a quote from the TBM or the, or you know a TPM hardware to say this is the kernel that has been booted, this is the software image that it is running, so that you don't have to, excuse me, so that you can trust that it, it is uh, actually running what you think it is. Well, that that would essentially be very useful. Um, let me answer that in, 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 in two parts. So uh, I think it will be very useful. Um, I'm always afraid that there's always some extra exploiter issue there that the system simply can't, can't figure out. And then we're running these devices for years on years because we think the TPM tells us everything is working, and then it's not. And specifically in our case, but I think also in the Tor case to some degree, but, but more in our case, it, we're dealing with um, essentially we're a firewall for medical healthcare, so we well, not, not a firewall, but we, we share medical data on one-on-one -on -one with parties over TLS connections, and we, we have some form of fetch access to certain documents on that contain medical, like private, pri privacy-sensitive data. So it's, it's, uh, you have to weigh the risks, I think. Um, the other reason that we didn't just take a TPM is because, um, in my experience, but maybe, maybe you know a lot better, you know a lot more about this, it's not that trivial to hook up a TPM to a random system. Um, the Chromebooks are very nice because they come with the TPM and Google wrote software for them, but if you just have a Raspberry Pi or a random development board, you can't just plug on a TPM. Um, so that was the other reason for trying to figure out how we can write something relatively simple that, that, that suits at least a part of our use case. And in your current build, there's, there's no way to have a secret in the TPM, is that correct? That it's running completely open source code and the user could potentially, uh, a local user could potentially uh, dump or uh, reflash the, the code in the TBM? Uh, whoever owns the hardware can, can of course just take our code and, and flash, flash whatever, whatever he or she wants on the microcontroller. Okay. Is okay, that so what you're asking? Yes, so, so that, that the, the, Simple. the, since <laughs> the TPM is, is closed source that mm -hmm. or and completely unreferable. That, that closes off that, that particular vector. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they're, they're complex devices. Um, of course, the, it's still a, a cor ARM Cortex, so <laughs> you don't know what it's exactly doing, but it's quite likely that, well, hopefully there's not a, a huge backdoor in there. I'm not saying that the TPMs have huge backdoors, but it could be part of your threat model. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Any other questions? Then I would li like to thank Melanie and uh, Guido, for their talk.